Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, the screenwriting step-by-step -step project, episode 171. Step 171. My name is Glenn Gers, and I come to you every Monday through Friday, if I can make it, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to let you look over my shoulder, share my screen as I write a script. And I'm doing this in order to teach a part of screenwriting that I think is kind of undertaught, which is the actual day-by-day, step-by-step, scene-by-scene, line-by-line process of writing a script. Doesn't matter what kind of script it is, you still have to make it into scenes and write them on the page and rewrite them and make them clearer and better and stronger. And that process is what you really have job to job, script to script, everything that you do, it's always the same process, even if the projects are very different. And every artist has their own process. So all I'm trying to do is show you the one that I worked out during my 25 year career as a writer on movies and TV, because I hope it will be helpful to you when you face the blank page. It is not the only way to do it. It's not the best way to do it. I think it's practical. I think you can take pieces of it, techniques, tools, use them the way you see fit, because everyone has to figure out their own way to be productive. Oh, hi, Division 5. <laughs> Good to see you. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the, the main ideas I have about screenwriting are on this channel as lessons in the, the under the subject heading Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, those sections have little uh, lessons on topics that the thumbnail says, genre, theme, character arcs. Those are very, very important. Those are the lessons I have to teach. What I'm doing here is just trying to show you how I work in case that's also helpful. But my real, what I have to tell you, it's there, it's free. Please go check it out. I think you will find the answer to many questions. All right, so let's get to work because that's why we are here. I am rewriting the script that I have done a rough draft for, uh, and that is the order of the day. That is the work. That is the thing we are here to do. Hi, Kirby Light. Um, so uh, we are actually halfway through the rough draft. And we've actually, we're actually hitting a part, part that's pretty good. So I'm only going to be tinkering a little, uh, fixing some, some words and lines and really moving fast um, until we get to the next section, which is not so good. But the next like five or more pages are, are actually pretty solid. Um, okay. Um, I'm just trying to condense because we are still, I don't know if you can see down here in the uh, lower, oh, I guess it's that way. <laughs> uh, the lower left-hand corner, you can see the page count, 31 out of, we're on page 31 out of 71. You can see it right there. And, um, and I need to get it to 60. So even cutting a line here and there, it does not hurt. Um, here, what, I, what I'm thinking is, does he need to point and, uh, yeah, I think so. I'm going to leave it because it doesn't cut, it doesn't help. Uh, to, it doesn't shorten or anything. Okay. Um, hello, Green Psycho Babe. Good to see you. Thank you for appearing with us here. Um, I am editing. I am editing. This is actually going to be some pretty quick editing. Um, uh, because I'm just tinkering a bit with the language. This this scene works. This is a good scene. I am proud of this scene. It, it's fun. It's uh, authentic. Um, hello, Chez and or Shay. All right. So here's the thing. Norman opens the freezer, taking out a bag of fruit. So um, why not just takes... I don't need to say he opens the freezer to take out the bag because if he's taking the bag out, takes a bag of frozen vegetables from the freezer and applies it and presses it. 
See, now that's not about making it uh, shorter in the lines. It's about making the words clearer so that the eye moves through it, so that the reader gets it um, and, and, and is involved in the story, not in blah, blah, blah. You know, he opens the freezer and takes out a bag and puts it to his eye because it's cold, blah, blah, blah. We do not need to do all of that. Yellow, Pedro. Hi, Thumper. Hello, Natasha. Um, okay. So this is another one. This is very long. Applies it clumsily. It clumsily to his cut. Applies it clumsily to his oh, stings. Uh, once again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blend these two into one. Uh, all right. See now, that's that's uh, there we go. Um, Chez sounds like it looks. No, <laughs> that's okay. I like Chez better, actually. Chez is more interesting. Um, hello, Janae. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. I uh, hope everyone is well. I'm just saying, is there... Uh, I think this is right. This is a little long, but it's important. It's it's a it's a layer of psychology. I think that it's good to keep going. Um, using the drippy soapy cloth. Just I'm just I'm just seeing like is there even a word I can No, that's right. Okay. She's that's pressing. Um I'm sorry I'm here like this. I'm sorry I'm here like this. I just didn't want Mr. Dunn. And who is Mr. Dunn? He's a mess dealer. And you know him, so, uh, right? And you know him. How? I'm in a. This is. Uh... You know, I don't even think I need to explain that he's reluctant. Wow, lots of people coming in. Hello. Hello, Marty Mac. I don't know if I've ever seen you before. Hi. Um, Javier Feliz. Yes, thank you to all the moms in the Americas and everywhere. I hope you all, those of you who have mothers and those of you who um, are mothers, um, uh, I hope you had a good Mother's Day weekend. How to do, <laughs> Jean? Um, You know, I think I think we're okay to not have too much. Uh... Matt the jailer's crime solving. He has a very deep sense of justice. I, I think, considering that they're like smashed up against each other, and she's got the thing up against his face, it's it's already pretty cool. Um... I don't think we need this. There we go.
I don't even think we need this. There we go. Lurking is absolutely fine. It is acceptable behavior for writers. <laughs> um, uh, yes, lurking is, is A-OK. -okay. You are all welcome to lurk. Um, okay, I, we have a down vote. Okay, I'm just curious about this. Like, whoever g gave the thumbs down, I just wonder what what was thumbs down? What was bad? Let me know. I want to improve my my educational value. All right. Um, what are you? Man, no, that's dumb. What are you? in all this there we go what are you in all this a journalist writing a book about online culture that's why i'm in the group so you're like a spy on them she sits down at the kitchen table all kitchen tables are little there we go sits down because when you sit down you're sitting you don't have, she sits at the kitchen, how else, how else, she's not going to sit up at the kitchen table. Uh, all right, oh, I'm embedded. Okay, this is, right, we need more of a ranty speech here. Um, no, I'm embedded in the culture. Okay, he's saying about online culture, so no, I'm embedded. Uh, no, no, because I think something wants Mm-hmm. Uh, I embedded myself. Whoa, whoa, where did that happen? Why, what's that? Okay, no, um, no. I embedded myself in this group, in this group, in, in groups, in, Several groups, several groups, yeah. several groups, several groups. Oh, I am, I am, I embedded myself in several groups to understand the way these so-called communities operate. <laughs> they are communities. Uh, okay. <laughs> I am, but maybe somebody thumbs down the, 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 the Bob Ross of screenwriting. I appreciate that, by the way. I feel, I feel like we're just adding a few trees here and uh, some some ranty speeches. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I need to I need to be much more. I am I am not Bob Rossy enough. Um, hi, Matthew. All right, um, because I think something wants you know so, several groups, several so called several so-called communities, several, several, in several communities. I embedded myself in several communities. I embedded myself in several communities. That's just too many uh, syllables. That's something to keep an eye on. Say it out loud. I embedded myself in several communities. Blah, 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 blah. Too much. I embedded myself in a several, in a bunch of groups, a bunch of groups. I embedded myself in a bunch of groups because I think something because I think something monstrous has happened to our world and we don't even see it because we're drunk on the rewards drunk on the rewards drunk on them because we're drunk on the rewards on the, sh the short digital condom Oh, more people are here. Hi, Larry. I hope your move went well. Hi, Dandelion. Um, okay, so uh, we are editing. We are editing this speech. When am I going to get... Okay, I'm just very briefly running to the end to see. So anyway, all right. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm going to go back to where I was. 
don't panic. I was just seeing if I get it's I, I've been cutting a bunch, but I'm not getting lower on my page count here. And sometimes that's because a page break has uh, been has retained remained. Um, and so now then now and then if you just run to the end of the document, it'll repaginate and and I'll find out that I've actually cut a page. But apparently I haven't. <laughs> no, I sorry, like I no, I embedded myself in a bunch. No, I'm embedded. I'm embedded. No, I'm embedded. No, I, I'm embedded. Because I think something monstrous has happened to our world. And we don't even see. It's not like that has happened. I think something monstrous has happened to our world. And we don't even see it because we're drunk on the um he's expressing um he's expressing an opinion <laughs> which is uh i it is not a theme of the series i don't necessarily agree with norman but but i think that he's raising the question of whether uh, online groups are a good thing or a bad thing um i i do not believe it's as simple as he's saying um even he is having problems with the fact that he's saying it um, so the answer is he is raising a theme, but he is not stating the finished theme. He is raising the question, which will be hopefully part of the game, part of the show. Um, no, I'm embedded. I think I'm gonna make that. Up. No, I'm embedded. Embedded, by the way, is not easy to say. Uh, I'm embedded because I think something monstrous has happened to our world and we don't even see it because we're high, we're drunk on the rewards, drunk on our, we're high on our own supply now. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I, it is possible. People do, people do sometimes look for things that I don't have to offer and that's cool. I accept that. Um, does Norman have an opposite? That's a good question. He has, a, in some ways, Madeline is his opposite. Um, and in other ways, Zena, I mean, there's sort of, it depends on what part. You mean someone who's speaking for online culture? Then definitely Zena. But that's scary because she turns out to be a murderer, serial killer after a while, because I'm sure she'll kill other people. Um, so the answer is, but I do believe other people will speak for uh, online groups more. I just haven't figured that out yet. Actually, one of the things I want to do is when I have finished this pass, remember the concept of the pass. You go through the script, you try and work on something, character, dialogue, a certain character, a certain theme, whatever it is. Uh, in this case, I'm just going through my, this is the, the make the scenes read clearly pass. When the pass is done and you do other passes, you do many, many, um, but when this pass is done, I want to stop working on the text and and work on the uh, overview document, the the pitch of the whole series, um, because that's an important part of creating a series is to create the concept without detailing every step of it of the rest of the show. Because when you when you give someone a script for a pilot, they are going to say, "What happens in the rest of the show? What do you have in mind?" And you have to have that uh, ideally written down. Okay. So that's the next step. And when we get there, hope you know I may work out some of these themes a little more. I have not actually done that. Um, okay. Drunk on digital culture, because we're drunk on digital culture. Digital culture it took up. Oh, I got two because's here. Because, because. So this is going on too long. Because this is one, and we don't even see it. No, I'm embedded because I think something monstrous after all. We don't even see it. Period. Boom. Our way of seeing um, 
Uh, hello, Revolutionary Poetry, a.k.a. Dave D. Hi. Uh, Dave, Dave D. was a, uh, a student at um, Maharishi International University, which uh, is the university where the David Lynch Masters uh, program in screenwriting is uh, in Indiana, Fairfield, Indiana, and I have taught there a few times. I have gone there for a, a, a short guest lectureship for two or three days, and um, and so revolutionary poetry is a uh, <laughs> is is a former student from there. Uh, yes, um, we well we don't you know let's I have to be fair. I Norman is not me. <laughs> Norman is saying something. I like to write scripts where different people say things that I think are true, but they don't agree because I don't always agree with my own thoughts. I think most of us don't. And so what I like to do in a script is have people get into it um, because, oh, Iowa. <laughs> Did I say Indiana? Uh, Iowa, yes. Um, anyway, so uh, the whole point about, uh, ah, this is a great example. Uh, what you thought of them. I thought Michael Clayton was a brilliant movie in every way. I thought Michael Clayton is an amazingly good script. Um, it is beautifully filmed. It is phenomenal. Um, uh, and, and very much like that. It, it's raising ideas about corporate culture, although that was, <laughs> there's not really a good argument for the corporate culture in, in Michael Clayton. Um, so therefore, I would say uh, but but still, yeah, the uh, the idea is that different different characters are bringing different beliefs into a situation. That's how I like to write. Um, so I think some monsters have. We don't even see it. Because I think something monstrous happened, but we don't even see it. Because we're drunk on digital culture. Because, oh, look at that. Um, because now we see them. We don't even see it. Because digital culture. Uh, because digital culture has become how we see. <laughs> yeah, he should, he should be a little awkward. Digital culture has become how we see. See everything. So our way to see things can't see what so uh, and so the way we see things the way we see things can't see <laughs> the damage how it's poisoning. So the way we see things. Okay, let me see if this is working. No, I'm embedded because I think something monstrous has happened to our world and we don't even see it because digital cult because because digital culture is is how we see is how we see now is how we see now. We see every and, and, and it can't see itself itself, but it's poisonous. It's addictive. Uh, let's see. No, I, I'm in, I embedded. I'm embedded. Because I think something monstrous has happened to our world and we don't even see it. Because, as, because, because is bothering me. Um, to steel man characters I disagree with? What does steel man mean? Um, because that's interesting. Uh, okay, so tell me what steel man means. And I will tell you a response to that. Um, a tough lesson, but I was great. Um, I think some monstrous sound, and we don't even see it. We don't even see it because we see, because, 
because digital sync, we don't even see it. Digital culture is how we see now. So how can how can the how can the way we how can the way we see how can we see the way we see how can we see the way the way we see how can we see the way we see you know what I mean <laughs> it's poisonous it's poison it's addictive and it's poisonous it's addictive it's addictive and it's poisonous I don't know if poisonous is a good word because we're talking about a poisoner, a, a serial killer. Hi, Mythical. How are you? Um, <laughs> oh, that's cool. I've never heard that. Straw man, steel man. Okay, cool. Yes, that is true. You should do this. Okay, now I get it. Um, one of my first writing teachers taught me to steel man characters I disagreed with. That is incredibly valuable. Uh, I've always said um, that that I believe the way the thing the most important thing you could do is whenever you're writing a character, whoever they are, you have to see through their eyes when they are speaking, when you are writing them, when they are acting. You, it's really important to uh, authentically give them their life, make them understand how they feel, even if they are evil, um, because then. Uh, that feels real because everybody who's doing things thinks what they're doing is good. Um, even if it's like it's good to be bad, whatever it is, they are authentically doing what they do. And you can't inauthentically write them doing that. You need to steel man them. Uh, that I agree. Um, steel man versus straw man. Poison is good. Yeah, maybe it is. Um, I mean, this is not the greatest speech because it's. I'm just ranting here. Um, but that's okay. I mean, the whole point is that he's he's going. He is slightly ranting. Um, okay, I'm embedded because I think something monstrous has happened to our world and we don't even see it. Digital culture is how we see now. So how can we see see the way we see? <laughs> yeah, he's ranting. It's addictive. Um, This is kind of stupid. Um, I don't want him to... Uh, tech business, tech philosophy. Tech philosophy took over the world because it's... Tech philosophy took over the world because it's... Uh, making money and no one is questioning, which is just not true, no one is questioning whether it's a good philosophy, crowdsourcing, the abdication of responsibility, the destruction of our cause. The destruction of culture, not our culture. That's that's really creepy, racing race kind of thing. <laughs> the destruction of civilization. There, no nah, society. There we go. Uh, yeah. Did why why did you ask, uh, Nadja? Did you did you think it was because it was good? Um, I thought it was amazing. Um, I actually I can tell you that there's some some really just you can you can really break down those scenes for to study how someone is both carrying an idea and at the same time acting out in a, a moment of relationship. There's no point in that story when someone is not acting out of 
their being in the moment in their relationship. And that's what's so cool. Um, it's it, because it's like people are talking about things. So they're saying smart things, true things sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but at the same time, underneath it, there's this just dynamic power of, of what they are to each other. Um, uh, oh, you watched Frenzy. Okay, I, I did warn you. An odd blend of graphic violence and comedy, comedic. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the, the scenes with the wife's cooking are really funny. And um, and and one of the greatest horrifying... Oh, look, they took away the, the, the down thumb. Thank you, whoever that was. Um, um, uh, some, by the way, <laughs> sometimes people accidentally click the, down, the thumbs down. Um, anyway... Um, in Frenzy, aside from this little running thing, this running bit about the main police officer's wife being into gourmet cooking and cooking just inedible garbage, um, uh, maybe not. I don't want to diss somebody's food choices. But, um, but the other thing that's really funny is there's this sequence when the serial killer has serial killed a woman and she grabbed his tie pin. He's like a, like a little uh, jeweled with his initial in it. It's very distinctive. Lots of people know that he wears this thing. And she grabbed it during the, the, the fight uh, while he was strangling her and he didn't realize it. And so the next day he's like, or later that night, he's like, oh crap, where is it? And he realizes she took it. So he has to go find her. She, he dumped her body in a, a uh, he's a fruit and vegetable salesman, and he dumps the body in a truck full of potatoes. And so he has to chase down this truck full of potatoes on the road in the middle of the night, and he climbs in the back to find the corpse, which is now buried in potatoes. And he has to get the tie pin out of her hand, but rigor mortis has set in, and so he has to break her fingers one by one. It is both incredibly horrifying and really kind of funny. It's it's very sick. It's it's brilliant and not for the faint of heart. And I do not necessarily uh, endorse that anyone should see it. It's it's a very it's especially triggering for anyone who has strong feelings about sexual violence because it is uh, exploring sexual violence and at the same time uh, in, 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 in sort of romanticizing it. It's it's which is traditional for films of the 70s. But um, anyway, yeah, Frenzy, thank you. Um, uh, it is, but th but that's the most important thing. That's where you get into it. Um, uh, and, and by the way, you can get, you don't have to make them good. An evil character can be evil, but you have to think, what does it feel like to be evil? What does it feel like to hate that much or to feel that weak that you attack others. What does it feel like? And you have to decide what it is um, to be in that frame of mind. That is not fun, but you can't have shame around it. You have to you have to engage in that to be good at it. You have to, just like a good actor has to authentically have some take on the feeling, you got to go there if you want to, if you want them to be a good character. Um, yes, uh, Michael Clayton, one of the things that's great is there is a man who makes these r long speeches, which Tom Wilkins, the actor, handles brilliantly. Um, and they are brilliant speeches. They are um, of, of a man with mental illness. He's, he's apparently bipolar um, or, or in some way um, he's, he's um, possibly schizophrenic. Whatever he is, he is um, thinking that he has seen a, a great vision um, and in one way, he actually has. He's seen, recognized that he has been uh, working with people who are evil. Um, and he's, um, he, but at the same time, he's insane. And these speeches are, are, are fabulous. Actually, a lot of good speeches in there. Um, yo, you definitely should see it. See it a couple of times. It's really, really good. Um, the first time you see it, you're just going to go with it. Um, anything good the first time you see it, just enjoy it. But then watch it again and think about how do these scenes work? The first scene that we see Michael working, um, there's a great scene with him playing cards, but then he goes, he gets called to a, uh, a, a client, a potential client. One of their rich clients has, has done a hit and run. And this is not a spoiler. 
um, it's early on. And Michael's job is to advise him because the, the real lawyer is, is Michael's a fixer lawyer. He's a, 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 a seedy, creepy, uh, <laughs> bad, <laughs> helping people do bad things because that's his job. Um, so he's trying to advise this guy on how to handle the fact that he's going to be arrested for having hit and run somebody. Um, and the the rich guy is so privileged that he's like, hey, make this go away. And Michael Clay is like, I'm here because I'm the guy they send when you can't make it go away. I'm here to help you deal with it um, a, a, safely. You know, it's the best you can. It's, it's a brilliant scene. It's really, really good because there's a lot of self-loathing in Michael, but there's also a deep, deep loathing of his client. It's, it's, which is all about Michael's whole story is about how he hates what he has become as a lawyer. It's, it's fabulous. Um, yes, we do. This is really true. First of all, be specific when you are fine, when you are writing someone that you don't believe in or, or like, um, uh, recognize one thing is that first of all, there are many versions of who that person is and your specific take on it will make it good. So be specific. Don't just be gener you know, generic. Oh, I love power. You may, but why? How? What does it feel like to that person? Um, and then the other thing I think that, that, that Thumper is saying, we all have it in us, is we do. We all have in us all emotions. Um, I believe that we all have a reservoir, a gigantic eternal reservoir of every possible emotion um, and that you can tap into it if you are not afraid of uh, being judged or being bad. Um, and you're not. You're writing. You're not. It's not bad. It's OK. You are writing. You are in. Uh, you are. And, and you and you always have time when you're writing to rethink it, to, to, to balance somebody's evil with, with some good, some undermining good that will, will take down the evil. Um, whatever it is, there's, there's really ways to do it. But you can't hold back. You are not the judge. When you are writing a character, you are not judging the character. You are um, trying to give that character their fullest voice. The script as a whole will judge them. But, but in order to write them, you can't judge them. Um, yes, Michael Clayton, you cannot ever, ever beat this. Uh, with, uh, while focusing on action and description, description flows easily. Action seems hard to write. Well, once again, think about character. Action comes out of somebody's need. If you know what they need, if you know what they want, if you know what they're trying to do, uh, you will have a better time writing uh, any kind of action, which is why I would say, watch this video. Building character arcs is about that. And also this video, dramatic action. Like I said, um, this this how to write a script thing is lovely, but my real best advice is actually in these videos. Okay. Um Real life evil is about what they like. That's an interesting idea. Explore it. Explore. Explore. Find your way. Um, I think I have the script. The, the script for, for Michael Clayton is available. It was up for awards. Anything that was up for awards in the past 10 or 15 years, they made a copy available uh, in PDF and they gave it out. And usually people drop those on the internet all over the place. If you search Michael Clayton's script, PDF, I'm pretty sure you will find it. If not, contact me. As you know, you can contact me by going to writingforscreens.com and clicking the button that says, contact me. There's, it's all over the place and you can, it will open up a little window. You send me an email. Um, Natasha, if you cannot find the script screenplay for Michael Clayton, um, contact me that way and I will, I will get it to you. Yes, that's also a very good idea. Um, yeah, very good. Oh, never mind. Kitchy's got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, research is also yeah. Like think, do some research. There's also there's some fascinating books. There's a book called Why They Kill by uh, a brilliant journalist named Richard Rhodes. Um, Why They Kill, um, which is a, a psychological uh, journalistic insight into why people kill. 
Um, and, and it's quite powerful and, and fascinating. Um, yes, modeling villains on real fictional people is a, yeah, uh, this is very, very good advice. I'm making notes. Uh, okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, the, yes, I'm the guy you pay. Indeed. Uh, yeah, the Michael Clayton cannot be. Also, yeah, I'm doing the Michael Clayton. Um, Yes, your, your villain should be as three-dimensional as your pro hero or protagonist. This is uh, every character. Once again, I'm going I'm to push this one. Character arcs. Uh, uh, every single character, the smallest bit character, is three-dimensional if you do it right. Um, okay, cool, great. Um, oh, yay, great. I'm so glad. Thank you so much, Flying Over Trout. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, yes, no, giving the redeeming, it is not, actually, it is not necessary to give a villain redeeming qualities. I, I do believe that that is, that's a, a cliche that has come into, um, into parlance in Hollywood. Um, I do not believe, um, that, that the, uh, you need to give them redeeming qualities. What I, what I do believe is that you need to be able to write them authentically as they see themselves. They can be monsters. I'm trying to think of some really good, like just just terrible people, but they, they don't know they're terrible people and they act out of their own selfish needs. Um, but that's very convincing. Um, uh, a lot of villains are like that. You don't have them. They definitely do not have to be have redeeming qualities. You don't have to feel empathy or sympathy for a villain. That is just a cheap trick that Hollywood suddenly got into pulling because they thought it was different um, after a long time of, of villainy villains. Um, but but that's not that's that's a you know maybe it is maybe it isn't that's that's your your choice your philosophical vision of that story. Um, but the the important thing is whether or not they are redeemed or redeemable, they are still authentically focused on their version of what life is. And that's what you need to do. You need to make them truly, truly evil if they are evil. Um, <laughs> 18 viewers and 18 likes. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Oh, 19. Um, all right. Um, Self-censoring is a, a harmful. Um, if you have, if you have a, a character... Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing I would say is being extreme can be fun, um, but but the main thing is just remember that you have a safe place to to explore. Like write a version that you think is so bad, shameful, evil, uh, dangerous, uh, uh, offensive. Right? Just don't show it to anyone. Then then look at it and think, what in this do I want to use and what do I not? Cool. You don't have to use it. This is writing. You're not you're not performing live jazz. You are not you're not improvising in front of people. You are improvising safely among drafts. That's what drafts are all about. Um, okay. Um, I've never seen that. I've heard good things about it. Um, yeah, a lot of good characters. Uh, Hype Williams Belly. Uh, <laughs> All right, Jean, Jean has, has made a very good insight here. A defendant who was sorry his wife made him kill her. Yes, exactly. Uh, wow, yeah, okay. Uh, meanwhile, I have just totally flaked on this speech. Um, and this is, this is one of those cases. I'm writing this speech. It is at least more coherent than it was before, but I, I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think this is good. Um, and I'm not sure how much, um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to rewrite it now, but, um, also this is really, this is a very, very valuable lesson. This speech, um, once you've written something down, you tend to take it seriously. Like I have this sentence, I think something monstrous has happened to the world and we don't even see it. I'm not sure that we don't even see it is that important. But now I've been trying to explain why we don't see it and stuff. 
And, and sometimes you remember, you just wrote down a phrase. You can just cut that phrase. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I'm going to come back to this later when I'm stronger about it. Um, okay. Character is quite reserved and not super chatty. I don't want that effect on how... It is. Yes, absolutely. Characters do not have to speak to take action. This is very important. Um, they, they, they may not be chatty. They may be reserved, but they should be doing something. Um, they should be taking action. That's my tip. My tip, and let me again re remind you about what action is. Hang on. Uh, dramatic action, by which I do not mean chasing and fighting. I mean, an action can be changing ledger <laughs> numbers in a ledger. That's an action. It can be an action with huge consequences. Um, they, there are many characters who do not give a lot. Actually, oh, there's there's a great movie with a very, very reserved character. Hold on. Um, the Lunchbox. Um, check out this movie here. Let's, let's do this. It's called The Lunchbox. Um, it is an Indian movie. It is a story about um, a, a man and a woman. Of, uh, uh, it's, it's a story about two people who meet because the, uh, in India there's a system by which people have their lunch, office lunches delivered from their home to um, or, or from a restaurant um, by these delivery guys. And the delivery guy switches two people's lunches. And so a man uh, who ex usually expects to get his lunch from uh, a, a restaurant gets it from this woman who's having trouble in her marriage. And uh, it's it's an amazing movie. This is a phenomenal movie. It's called The Lunchbox. Um, I do not remember who directed it. I do not remember the, uh, the, the name of the actor who, who died recently. Uh, but, but the main male character is extremely reserved, and it is phenomenal. Um, anyway, uh, there's lots of examples of, of reserved characters. But the, the point is, someone is, can be reserved, but they have to uh, be um, taking action, making things happen in the, in the story. Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, the Arrival is a phenomenal, that's another phenomenal, amazing script. Um, yeah, yeah, James Cameron is not... Uh, known for his subtlety. <laughs> James Cameron, the thing you want to study Cameron for, and this is great, he understands dramatic action, he understands characters and, and story, and he goes all out with them, but nobody is subtle. <laughs> there ain't no subtle in Cameron, but that's something you can learn a lot from because it's all there to be seen. There's <laughs> there, the, there, the, the way characters are um, revealed is very clear, and that's cool. You you can learn a lot from Cameron, but you cannot learn subtlety from them. Um, um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, great. Figure out why why that matters in your story. Um, I think this is a great idea. Somebody who does not have much to say, but then the question is, is that a problem? Um, or is it something admirable that other people learn from? Like, figure out how that becomes pivotal, how it becomes a part, a, a, a necessary part of the story that's so important that it's actually part, it's like actually somewhere in the ending, is somewhere in the, something about his uh, not having much to say has to mean something to the story. Um, yeah. That absolutely, there there are such characters. That is absolutely fine. There is nothing wrong with that as long as it has some meaning. Is it because they are um, they don't like people much? And if so, do they find one person that they do like, um, or are they just smarter than everyone else? Whatever it is, how does that play out in the story? This is the most important thing about character. It's how does the character play out in the story? How does the character relate to what happens, what they, what they are doing? That's where you get the, uh, any form of character, any type, the most uncharismatic, boring, angry, ugly, whatever it is, they can be strong if you are giving that, that issue a part of the story. 
That's it. Hello, Fabric Trove. I have never met you before. How much scene description is... Uh, um, I... Very... First of all, not much. Uh, you, do, you don't want to do a lot. Um, I have done an AMA on this, and I will try and find the uh, the name of it. But if you look through my live streams, you will see uh, it's, it's the ones with the yellow screenwriting AMAA. Uh, ask me almost anything. There's one which is about how much description should you be. Check, read the descriptions. Um, but how my, I, I went into it in, in a lot of detail. I actually gave um, examples from about uh, eight or nine scripts um, showing how it, that you did it. Um, so that that's, I, I, I can't do it again, um, but it's there. It's somewhere in my archive is, uh, is that question as I believe it's the title question. Um, so look into it. If Fabric Trove, for some reason, you cannot find that, um, what you can do is contact me uh, and say, where was that? <laughs> which which episode was it in? And I will get it. Just go to writingforscreens.com, click the button, contact me. It will open up a window where you can write me an email, and you can ask me that question because this question is a good question. I've just already answered it in what I must say is brilliant detail. Um, no, that's that's not going to be a problem. That's that's the story. The story the story is that one of them is is reserved and one of them is is quote overpowering or big. And how does that play out? What do they learn from each other? What what strengths and weaknesses does that reveal about them? Um, yay! Love the lunchbox. The lunchbox is a dynamite movie. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Love the lunchbox. Let's let's just let's just show that again. The lunchbox. Um, if you want to see a great character story, which is it's just beautifully done by like very small little action. This it's fabulous. Um, okay. So. All right. Okay, so by the way, this dialogue is excellent. Hey, hey, let's get you. See, I'm going to do this just because it saves a line. And gosh darn it, I am going to save enough lines to get off page 71. Um, um, quiet character can add suspense. Exactly. Um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Character, quiet, quiet character, or someone who is watchful, thoughtful, um, yeah, they can have immense power. Um, oh, there's a lot of characters who sort of keep to themselves. There's one in um, uh, uh, Euphoria in the, in the recent season. Um, there's, a, there's a new guy who comes in who, who becomes um, uh, Zendaya's drug buddy, and, and he's, he's actually pretty quiet. He's a musician. Um, he's actually a real musician. I can't remember his name, but he's really good. Anyway, um, uh, the uh, um, okay, got two more questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here um, and answer these two last questions. Um, the latest Star Trek is fan motivated, episodic, and looks like it will be. This is a good opportunity for spec writers. Not really. Um, they TV series don't take. Um, uh, it's not like they're going to hire like you can like submit a spec and they'll go oh you know cool well and I guess maybe uh, I mean, like I don't want to say never because maybe some one principle of this show is hey we want fans to write in and write specs but I but usually they have a staff and they're doing that themselves and if they were going to write they were going to hire someone to add in scripts that isn't on the staff they would hire 
from the, the agents and writers guild and people they know. Um, so the answer is, um, I don't think it's a good opportunity for spec writers um, in terms of like, they're going to buy a script from an unknown. Um, uh, I mean, and once again, it could be that that's a policy of theirs, but, but ordinarily, um, if a show already exists, it's got a staff. It's got people that they hired and probably a whole lot of people they wish they could have hired, but you can only hire so many. So they've got a list of people to go to if they were going to have somebody outside the staff write. Um, huh. I will, thank you. I will look into that. Um, uh, let me, uh, tips on writing a character who is drunk. Uh, the first tip I would say, hold on. Um, famously about acting drunk is uh, a drunk person is trying not to be drunk. <laughs> the drunk person is always trying to conceal the fact that they're drunk. Um, but I would also say um, the thing about being drunk is you have to decide what does drink do to this particular person? Because for some people, drunk makes them sad. For some people, drunk makes them giddy and uninhibited. What, what you're really looking at is what does being drunk do for this person? And, um, and what is going to be released or shown or, um, or, or weakened or strengthened by the intoxication. That is, and then think about what the value is of their being drunk in the story. Ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, there is one called How Much Detail. Sorry, Division 5. Mythical has, has dunked on you here. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, so, yeah. This is this is what you want to see. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> um, okay. Um, far as far as drunk, the main thing about drunk is to remember um, that you have to decide what the value, the story value. With all of these things, the point is you're telling a story. Anything that you want to have about this, it's not just a judgment on drinking or on shyness. It's about this particular story. What does this? drunkenness have to do with the story? Is it going to make them say things they've never said? Is it going to make them um, uh, fail at something? Is it, uh, wh why are they drunk? And what happens because they are drunk? What does their drunkenness release? That's the point of the drunkenness. Then just think, you know, sort of get into the frame of mind of like, what will I say if I was uninhibited? What would I say if I was them and I was um, unable to speak clearly, or if I was speaking too honestly, what what is it exactly, specifically, that being drunk does for them? And then just spew, try and brainstorm, just let let it out, see what happens, and then you just sort of shape it. Um, you know, is it comedy drunk? Is it is it tragedy drunk? There's lots of different drunks. Um, okay, so we have we have accomplished another hour. Um, and it is good to see you. And please uh, do go write something.